it should stir praise within our hearts. Amen. Amen. We should want to stand up and shout and jump and around and say, God, thank you for all that you've done. So as I, as I pray, I want you to meditate. Just let the Lord remind you of something that he's done for you that would cause your heart to say, thank you, God, for what you've done. So, Lord, as we, as we, let's go ahead and stand. We're going to get ready for this song service. Lord, we thank you for what you've done. You've given us life eternal. You've forgiven us of our sins. You've delivered us from darkness, and you have shown us your marvelous light. Lord, I ask you to remind each individual here now what you have done for them, and let the praises of their heart just come out of their mouth with the breath that you've provided. Let us return it back to you in praise and offering of thanksgiving and our gratitude and our humble thankfulness that you are Lord, you are in control, and you are here with us now. Come, let us worship the Lord together now in Jesus' name. Amen. Are back to our study of the book of, of Acts. Uh, we're going to finish up uh, the rest of Acts chapter 16. As we're, I, I hope this has been helpful to you as we're walking through this. Um, it's kind of daunting to go verse by verse through the entire book of Acts, but I, there's just so much good stuff here. Duh, it's the Bible. All right. But I want to begin with words of Luke. Luke wrote the book of Acts. He wrote the gospel according to, to Luke and then wrote, wrote the book of Acts. And uh, he narrates through that. I want to begin with uh, Luke chapter 4, some ver words of Jesus that Luke had recorded prior to his writing the book of Acts. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus, quoting from Isaiah chapter 61, Jesus said this, Luke 4, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Well, Jesus, we are so thankful that you have come to proclaim liberty. We are so thankful that you have come to set captives free. We gather today because you have come to set captives free. You've given your life to pay for our sin. You've risen from the dead to give us new life. You've sent your Holy Spirit that we might be empowered to do your work and your will in this earth. Lord, we are so very thankful on this Thanksgiving week. Um, Father, we, have, we admit we've been a bit grumpy as of late. And all that's going on in our nation, we have been a bit, been a bit grumpy. Lord, would you give us hearts of gratitude and may the center of that gratitude be the understanding that you have come to set us free from sin, to set us free from a life that wandered from your goodness. Lord, you have been so, so good to us. And Father, thank you for our time together. As we open up your word, would you speak to us? And we ask you that in Jesus' name. Amen. So Luke wrote this Gospel account, according to, to Luke, the book of Acts that we've been looking at. And here he records the words of Jesus that Jesus has come to proclaim good news. The gospel means good news to the poor. And we, after receiving the gospel, we are to continue that work, right? That's what the book of Acts is all about. The gospel accounts, what Jesus has done, who he is, what he's accomplished for us, the book of Acts... God pouring out His Spirit on His people to continue to proclaim the good news. As we turn our attention to, back to Acts chapter 16, we would left Paul and Silas. We picked up Timothy. In verses 9 and 10, uh, Paul had this vision of a man from Macedonia, which is modern northern Greece, to come, come and help us. Uh, this, this open door to Europe, we looked at that last week to go and proclaim the good news. So they set sail across the Aegean Sea, and God was going to lead them to the city of Philippi. 
the people of Philippi are going to experience, encounter the good news. I've entitled this message, When the Gospel Comes to Town. When the Gospel Comes to Town. Amazing things happen when the gospel comes to town. Amazing things happen when the gospel, uh, when we are confronted with the gospel, amazing things happen. Good things happen. Hearts are changed. Resistance happens. We're going to see all of that. We're going to look at, nobody's neutral. We're going to look at kind of four accounts in the rest of uh, Acts 16, verses 11 to 40. We're going to get through all that. Uh, and we're going to see the 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 impact that the gospel had in this city of Philippi, the, the first city in, in Europe that is evangelized, the first church in Europe that is established. We'll turn your attention to verses 11 and 12 before we jump into our, our outline. Luke writes, So setting sail from Troas, we, again, Luke is included here. He's going to stay with them um, in this journey to Philippi, and then he's going to stay in Philippi. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage, voyage to Samoth, Thrace. Um, yeah, you tell me. The following day to Neapolis, that's the port city near Philippi. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. So that sets the stage. They cross the Aegean Sea. They come to uh, Philippi, and there they are going to begin to proclaim the gospel. A word about Philippi before we, again, get to our outline. Philippi, very prominent, very influential city. In the past, it had been a, a, a Greek uh, stronghold, became a, a strategic military stronghold of the Greek Empire. And in re recent centuries, uh, as Luke write th writes this, it had been become part of a Roman colony. That means um, Roman culture, Roman political structure, Ro Roman economy, tax structure, all of that, Roman culture, legal system, uh, part, of the, part of Rome itself, if you will. And it was nearby the seaport of, of Neapolis, which uh, is what brought much of the commerce there. These missionaries now, Paul, Silas, now picking up Timothy, the rest of the team, picking up Luke, the rest of the team, they are, they are straying farther and farther from Jerusalem, farther and farther from Jewish influence. And they are truly, this is truly becoming a foreign missions trip. They're outside of a predominantly Jewish culture now, and they are certainly in the midst of, of a Greek culture, Roman society. Philippi had famous, was famous for the school of medicine. Many think that perhaps Luke studied medicine in Philippi. Maybe that's why he stayed in Philippi until, uh, until they are going to come back. We'll read about that in chapter 20. Sometime from now, uh, as they are coming back uh, this way, back through Philippi again, and, and Luke will pick them up there. Later, Paul is going to write this letter to the Philippians, this, this church that is going to, we're going to see it, established this morning. God raises up a church there in Philippi. Paul would later write perhaps one of his warmest, one of his most personal letters to this, this church in Philippi. Uh, he was very, very fond of not always the way he was treated by the locals, but he was very fond of the church that God raised up in Philippi. So the gospel comes to town. It comes to this town of Philippi. And let's look at these four kind of responses of the gospel in Acts chapter 16. First, the influential. The influential are transformed. Best word I could come up with there. The influential are transformed. Verses 11 through uh, or 12, let's pick up at, uh, excuse me, 13. Uh, they've, they've come to uh, Philippi, this this prominent city of Macedonia. Verse 13, And on the Sabbath day they, were, they went outside the gate to a riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and spoke to the woman, women who, who had come together. 
One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, uh, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. The influential are transformed. Apparently, there's no synagogue in Philippi. It could have been either because of uh, harassment that folks didn't want, the locals did not want uh, the, the Jewish religion to, to flourish there, Judaism. Uh, I read this week that there's a sign on the uh, outside gate of Philippi entering the city that said, no uh, unfamiliar religions are welcome. Or it could be that there weren't enough Jewish men. It took 10 adult Jewish males to constitute opening a synagogue in a city. Perhaps there was not enough Jews. This is a predominantly Gentile city. Or perhaps they just didn't want one. We don't know. But they, they made their way to a place of prayer. And um, Luke says, we supposed that there'd be a, you know, did they hear? Did someone say, hey, you know, there's no synagogue here, but folks will gather down by the riverside? Uh, it was common for people where there wasn't a, a synagogue to gather alongside rivers uh, for whatever reason. They thought there might be one there. They heard, overheard someone saying, yeah, there's a gathering, a prayer gathering. Don't have a synagogue, but folks will gather for prayer, worship down by the riverside. So that's where they went, and they discover this group of women. And it isn't it interesting, um, all the knocks that Christianity gets today from our culture. We're going to get more into that somewhat. Um, it was women who for, were the first witnesses of the risen Christ, right? It was women. The first, we're going to see the first convert in Europe is a woman. They, they find this gathering of women. They are gathered together for prayer. They probably, they probably welcomed someone like a Paul. I don't know if they knew who he was. Maybe they'd heard of him. Maybe not. Maybe he just shared his credentials. Uh, yeah, I was a, a Pharisee, a persecutor of the church, had an experience with Jesus. Uh, either way, they heard about this Paul, and they opened up this meeting for him to teach, and he began to teach, because that's what they were there for, right? He wasn't just there, uh, let's go find a place, place of prayer, although they would have wanted to do that. Uh, they were there to evangelize, and so Paul, typically his MO, would be to start in a synagogue and uh, share what God has done in Christ in that setting, and here he finds a group of uh, worshipers of the God of Abraham gathered together, and he begins to teach. And one of those women was a woman named Lydia from Thyatira. Interesting, Thyatira was part of the Lydian kingdom. Some think that Lydia was just a nickname, like woman uh, of Lydia, and she just became known as Lydia from the Lydian kingdom. We don't know. But Thyatira was well known for its commerce, and in particular, purple fabric which was worn by royalty and, and nobility. If you're wearing purple today, you are certainly royal and noble and, and a K-State fan, maybe. But in that day, purple dye was hard to come by, very expensive. It was very rare, very expensive. Thus, it became the sort of the symbol of nobility, even royalty. And Lydia was a seller of purple goods, purple fabric, and from all that, we gather that she was probably very successful. Uh, she was dealing in this expensive product. She was from Thyatira, a very uh, robust uh, commerce that went on there. Probably very successful, probably very well-known businesswoman. Uh, we're going to read that she had guest rooms to invite uh, others to come stay and all, put all that together. Uh, she probably, at this point, did not have a husband, was very well-to-do, and probably well-respected. And Luke says that she is a worshiper of God. That's a term that is used of non-Jewish people who have embraced the God of Abraham or the teaching of the God of Abraham, teaching of the Jewish people. She's a Greek woman who worshiped the God of Abraham, right? She was hungry for truth. She was seeking truth. And here Luke records that the Lord opened her heart. 
And from that, we see the dynamic of evangelism, right? It's God who does the work, right? It's not our slick presentation of the gospel that, that opens people's eyes and opens their heart. God, by his spirit, opens eyes, right? God opens up the heart, and yet, for some reason, he chooses to use us. If you're here today and you're a believer in Christ, it's because God opened your eyes. He opened your heart. He allowed you to see who Jesus is and what he's done. But God probably used a person, right? Somebody's teaching, maybe somebody on the radio, maybe a family member, maybe a friend. So we see this dynamic that it is God who does the work. It is not us. We, we don't technically evangelize anybody. God does the work, but he uses us, right? We open our mouth. We do gestures of kindness. We exhibit the fruit of the Spirit that the gospel produces, and God reaps the harvest, if you will. The influential are transformed. Here we have someone who's really uh, outside of the Greek Roman magistrates. Uh, this woman is, is very high up on the social ladder. And the takeaway there that we want to leave you with is this. Lydia and her household were fulfilled by the good news. Lydia and her household were fulfilled, completed by the good news. They valued the teaching of, of the God of Abraham. Now they have met the God of Abraham, Jesus Christ. They, they embraced the teaching of Judaism. Now they have met the God of Judaism. And she extends hospitality, uh, says she prevailed upon them to stay in her home, Perhaps, we don't know, perhaps Paul, Silas, Timothy, Luke said, uh, you know, it just wouldn't be right to be staying in a woman's home, and, and she prevailed. No, 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 I want you to stay with us. They finally, they finally gave in. You know how hospitable people are. Um, no, come on, you're staying here. I'm not taking no for an answer. Um, maybe you're like that. You know people like that. Lydia was like that. She prevailed upon them. And we see the, the fruit of the Spirit is evident, right? Hospitality is a fruit of the Spirit, and, and already the fruit of the Spirit is evident in her. Uh, they had made, they'd shared Christ with Lydia and the rest of these women, and obviously the rest of her household. They come to Christ. Um, no mention here of ages, and people say, well, what, like little babies or this and that. Uh, I think the, the bulk of the New Testament makes clear that... that um, People come to Christ not because mom and dad come to Christ, right, but because we come to a place where we recognize uh, who Jesus is. The, the influential are transformed. Let's go, let's take a look now, secondly, at the bottom rung, if you will, of the social structure. The oppressed are delivered. Verses 16 through 18, the oppressed are delivered. Looked at an influential businesswoman, probably well-known, probably well-to-do. Now we're going to look at another encounter, verses 16 through 18. As we are going to the place of prayer, so they're on their way again, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her own, who brought, and brought her owners much. Just the, the mention of that word owners, doesn't that... Hmm. And brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Hmm. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And, he came, and, and it came out that very hour. The oppressed are delivered. They're on their way again to this place of prayer, and they are met by this demonized slave girl. Perhaps the devil was well aware that something's going on in town. We have a new guest in town proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. She's got a spirit of divination, an evil spirit by which she's Attempting to predict the future, and may I say, that's a perversion of the spirit of prophecy of God, right? And Old Testament, we read about false prophets who either just prophesying for their own gain or, or moved by pagan gods, pagan spirits. So this gift of hers, it's oppression, right? Oppressed by the evil one. 
was being exploited for profit by her handlers, her owners. I think we could call her ministry a non-profit ministry. Huh? P-R-O-P-H-E-T. You get it. Um, indeed. Throughout history, throughout history, diviners and witch doctors and shamans uh, have greatly influenced military leaders, uh, political leaders, um, the Greek uh, military commanders were known to seek out um, diviners who, you know, I, I'm, I'm hearing from the spirits, from the gods that we ought to uh, formulate here and attack these folks and do all that. And history records uh, through the ages, people trusting. I've been in places where witch do doctors call the shots for a community and people live in fear of that. And here she was, got a spirit of the evil one. She's, uh, may I say, the devil doesn't know the future, but the devil can predict as well as anybody what might happen. And so uh, here she's moved upon by this evil spirit and, and predicting the future. And these guys think, hey, we can make money off her because people want to know what's going to happen. And so that's the, way that, that's the dynamic here. So she's following them around saying, hey, these guys, these guys are of the, the one true God, and, and they're telling you the way of salvation. What? Was she confirming these missionaries? That, that's a head scratcher, isn't it? Uh, was she, was she on their side? What was she doing? Uh, or was this demon simply acknowledging that hey, there, there's a, there's a greater power around? S some say that maybe this is that the heart of this girl just crying out, these guys have it right, and that thing that's messing with me does not have it right. And maybe there's a part of that, right? Does that make sense? She's crying out that. These guys have the truth, and I do not. Others say, well, that's the, the cry of the evil spirit, the demon, uh, saying, I, hey, I surrender. They've got it right. We're not sure. But today, today there's phonies, there's charlatans who just make stuff up for their own gain, and there's also people who operate in the supernatural, uh, demonic realm that are, that are moved upon by evil spirits, we need to be discerning today, right? Those that are empowered by the wicked one. So interesting that Paul spoke to this demon. He didn't speak to the girl. He spoke to the demon, commanded it to get lost. I'm tired of you. Why did it take a few days to, to come to this point? Maybe Paul's trying to figure out what exactly she's doing, and maybe she's drawing a crowd and playing off that. That's hard to believe, but it could happen. Um, and he doesn't speak to the girl. He speaks to the demon. I command you in the name of Jesus, be gone. May I say that's not a fair fight? That's not a fair fight. When the Spirit of God speaks to the spirit of the evil one, that is not a fair fight. John would write in 1 John 4, 4, little children, you are of God. And you, he's talking about evil spirits uh, in the first few verses of 1 John 4. Uh, Little children, you are of God, and, and uh, you have overcome them, talking about uh, evil spirits, for greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. But you are of God. You are of God, and, and you've overcome these, these evil spirits because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. May I say, sometimes we need to stand upon 1 John 4, 4 and say, I am of God, and greater is, is he that is in me than he that's in the world. When that stuff plagues our souls, when the temptations that we just can't shake, and when, when uh, lies that come into our minds, our hearts that we just can't shake, maybe it's time to stand on 1 John 4, 4. I'm a child of God, and greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen? Amen. There's a time to take a stand. And she was delivered. She was delivered. James would go on to write, James 2, verse 19, you believe in God, you believe that God is one, you do well. But the demons believe and shudder. This, this, this demon possessed girl, whatever this dynamic, and there's questions of this account. Luke doesn't give us as many details as we would like, but these demons understood they were up against something far greater than himself, right? The influential are transformed when the gospel comes to town. When the gospel comes to town, 
The oppressed are delivered. Here's the takeaway that we want to leave you with on that. The slave girl was freed when she encountered the good news. The slave girl was freed when she encountered the good news. We don't know what became of her. We'd love to find out. But she was delivered from her former bondage. The gospel, the gospel still breaks strongholds. And when those things grab a hold of your heart, I just can't shake it. I just can't quit this. I can't stop thinking of this. I can't stop being bothered by this or that. It's time to stand upon 1 John 4. 4. Little children, you are from God, and, and you have overcome that thing. For greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. May we proclaim the name of Jesus over all that binds us. huh? May we proclaim the name of Jesus over everything that binds us. Paul spoke to that thing. It took off. It realized that where, what these guys were saying, what they're doing. Let's not let the devil intimidate us, huh? He's strong. He's powerful. No doubt he's crafty. Um, but he ain't got nothing on the, on the spirit that lives within the believer in Christ. The influential are transformed. The oppressed are delivered. And so Paul's, uh, Luke has given us examples, uh, certainly not exhaustive, but of, of well-thought-of, well-respected people in the community, and then those who we would call maybe those who are struggling in that community. Third, the hard-hearted are irritated. Yeah, not everybody's a big fan when the gospel comes to town. Have you noticed that? Verses 19 to 24. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, drugged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. Now, Luke is just going to kind of casually mention this. They stripped them. They beat them with rods, verse 23, and when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering, them, uh, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Welcome to Philippi. The good news for these guys was bad news. The gospel's come to town. It's messing with our, with our uh, business, if you will. Those who are exploiting this girl, we're not willing, uh, the evildoers or the purveyors of evil, evildoers in that, uh, in that area were not happy that the gospel had come. We're reminded of the words of John in John 3, verse 19, that the light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. Light has come to Philippi, but some men... Loving darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil were irritated about the gospel coming. The gospel was costing them. It was, it was interfering with their business, if you will. And they were not willing to pay the price. And so what they do, they just made stuff up. Well, these guys are teaching stuff, stirring up our city. Uh, they're, they're causing trouble. We need to do away with them. Their complaints and their accusations. Uh, they didn't dare tell the truth. Hey, these guys chased off a demon from our girl, now we have to work for a living. Right? They couldn't say that. So they made stuff up. Hey, these guys are troublemakers. Uh, they're sending our city into an uproar. Roman culture acknowledged many gods and many sources of authority, and they were pretty lenient on belief systems that people had. But Judaism was tolerated typically in most uh, Jewish colonies but it was also resented, this whole notion of one God, one creator, one way. Uh, didn't go over real big in most Roman colonies. So, 
They take them into the marketplace. Uh, in the marketplace is where every, you know, all the goods are exchanged. If you've been in developing countries, you, you know what a marketplace looks like in that environment. Um, oftentimes there would be what would be called a, a judgment seat, and that's where the, in this case, Roman officials would come and make a, an edict here. The, this is what we want to tell you. We wanna, or uh, those that are convicted would be brought there, and like we're going to make an example of this guy. That's kind of what was going on here. So they dragged them to the marketplace, they stripped them, they severely beat them, they threw them into prison, into maximum security, in the inner prison, uh, put their feet in stocks. Again, may I remind you of the context here? They just delivered a girl from an evil spirit. And they said, oh, we, we can't have that. We, uh, we understand you've done this and that. And so they are stripped, publicly stripped, beaten, thrown into prison for delivering a girl from a demonic spirit. The takeaway we want to leave you with on there is those who love darkness resisted the good news. Some embrace it. Some rejoice over it. Some are freed by it. Those who love darkness resisted the good news. Isn't that, isn't that puzzling? Today, we live in a culture that embraces many gods, right? many sources of authority. But the mention of Jesus, who claimed to be the way, the truth, the life, not so much, right? One way, one Savior, that is, that is met with resistance today, isn't it? I don't know if you've noticed. But the gospel gets a pretty bad rap today. Uh, for all kinds of things. This goes on. I could go on and on and on and on. This goes on daily today in our culture. Uh, just this week, a uh, story broke that uh, Melissa McCarthy, uh, an actress working with HBO, uh, doing this 20 Days of Kindness. And so working together, their plan is to give $20,000 a day through these 20 days to different uh, charitable organizations, organizations that are doing work uh, in the culture, in our communities. And so she hears about Exodus Cry. Now, I was not familiar with Exodus Cry until this week. Exodus Cry has been around for over a decade, and they have been very, very effective in, in freeing, typically, women and children from um, sex business, sex slaves sex trafficking, right? Been very successful at delivering uh, folks from sex trafficking. But the founder of Exodus Cry is a Christian. So she puts Exodus Cry on her list. Uh, she and the HBO folk put Exodus Cry on her list and twi uh, the social media, Twitter in particular, uh, lit their hair on fire. How dare you uh, use this organization? The, the founder some years ago had made statements uh, to the effect that abortion is Holocaust, if the shoe fits, uh, had, had made statements about same-sex marriage as an offense to God, if the shoe fits. And so this, how can you dare support this, this heinous work of Exodus Christ? So you can find this. You can find this online. She uh, she uh, disseminated a one minute and six second uh, Twitter post. Uh, it's it's all over the internet now uh, of this absolute apology. Uh, and in part, her statement was this: It has come to our attention that our twenty days of kindness, which is a kindness hub that we started to shine a light on twenty great charities had one in there that, there's no other way to say it, we blew it. She said in a short video posted on Instagram, we made a mistake and we backed a charity that, upon proper vetting, stands for everything that we do not. A group that has given themselves and gotten very, very good at 
setting captives free, right? From delivering women and children, particularly from sex trafficking. And they stand for everything that we do not. She goes on. You can watch it. Um, if you've got a minute and six seconds to waste, uh, you, you can watch. And it's just heartbreaking to hear her look in that, see her look in this camera. And it's just, I'm so sorry. I hope I didn't offend you. I hope you still uh, are on board. with. I, I, we didn't know how horrible this group was. And on and on it goes. Could go, I mean, every day. This is, you say, Tom, that's just a crazy, loud minority. Yes, it is, but it is gr gaining steam in our culture. And especially in our education system, elementary education, higher education. I, I could go on and on. Recently, a book was written, Irresistible Damage, and it, it deals with this whole phenomenon uh, that is exploding now, of especially. Uh, teenage girls who are uh, feeling the need to transition from ma female to male. And it's a book that I understand well-researched and just, it just hey, think about this. Here's another side. It's not a, like an evangelism book or anything. It's just about this whole phenomenon that's taking place in our culture. And so Target had it on its shelves. And, of course, somebody with 1,400 Twitter followers, which sounds like a lot, but that's not a lot in the whole social media world, uh, they just went nuts and said, how can you sell this hateful stuff? And so Target pulled it off the shelf uh, with great apology. Now, I understand that Target has put it back on the shelf because it's a money thing, and it's just, that, that's all just a big battle that's going on right now. BLM and Antifa uh, burning Bibles in their, in their peaceful protests. Uh, burning Bibles, like for what? I mean, because it's such a hate, uh, such a hateful book, and um, tell me to stop. Um, our culture, like these, like these handlers of this demon possessed girl. Our our culture again, it's minority, but it's a noisy minority, and it is gaining steam in our culture. Says, do not mess with our sacred sins. Yeah, you can believe anything you want. You can have any kind of. Higher power you choose, but just do not mess with our pet sins, our favorite sins. If you do, the culture will come down on you. The segment of our culture today that looks at you sitting in church today and says you are a hateful bigot because you're sitting in a church. Because you're Christian beliefs. Does that even make sense? Kind of ignoring the, the homeless shelters around America, around the world that are run, operated, started by Christian people, right, on Christian perspectives. The food pantries across the planet, uh, orphanages across the planet, they're started by Christian people because they just, they've been touched by the gospel. The benevolence works. Turkey baskets, right? I mean, you're, you're just hateful, and I, we, we apologize if we said ever anything good about you. Um, well, we, have, we share a pretty good company, Paul and Silas. All right? We share a pretty good company. They had their culture come down on them. They're, they're introduced to full-blown Roman culture now. I mean, they've already suffered through some from Jewish culture, but um, the hard-hearted are irritated. They're stirring up the hornet's nest. They deliver. Can I go back to the context? They delivered a girl from an evil spirit who was being exploited by her owners, and they're the bad guys. They're the bad guys. The bad guys complain about the good guys, right? Bad guys say, you're not going to believe what these guys did. What'd they do? Well, they're not going to tell them the truth again. Well, they set our, our slave free from demonic oppression, and now how are we going to make a living anyway? Last, let's look at the rest of the chapter. Number four, the captives are set free, and a number of captives are getting set free in this deal. The captives are set free. And the first is a, a Philippian jailer. Let's look at uh, verses 25 to 34. So here, Paul and Silas, uh, apparently Timothy, Luke, the rest of the team had been separated from. They just took Paul and Silas, maybe as we're going to take your leaders. Uh, it seems like they're just 
perhaps the plan was just, we're going to beat them up real bad, put them in prison overnight, let them go, teach them their lesson. That seems like that's what's going to happen. So verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Did I mention their church setting? Inner prison, feet were in shackles. They'd been beaten severely with rods. By midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are, uh, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and, trembling with fear, fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him, and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. This Philippian jailer. Now, verse 25 uh, really is... A sermon within a sermon. Paul and Silas are set free, quite honestly, right? Um, they're singing and praying. In the, they've been beaten severely, put in, in stocks, and they are singing and praying. Again, a sermon within a sermon. You've heard many a sermon on that verse, right? And, and yet we're looking at the, at the greater context here. Their bodies were restricted, but their hearts were released. Songs in the Night. We might call them is a common response of suffering believers throughout history. Believers who are in a difficult, difficult place. Not in a place of their choosing, just that circumstances are very difficult. And believers through the, through the history of the church have found that, that they can find their way to freedom through songs in the night. Right? Through, through worship in the midst of difficult times, we can be... We can be released, if you will, from, from that which wants to hold us bound. Does that make sense? Songs in the night. Blessed is the believer who, in times of difficulty, discovers this dynamic of worship in the midst of difficult time that, that can, even though circumstances don't change, our, our heart changes, our hearts are set free. Many of the Psalms, many of the Psalms, David's and others, uh, many of the psalms are songs in the night, right? Worship in the midst of a difficult, difficult time. And Luke points out that the other prisoners were listening. Why did he say that? I think there's something going on here. When, when, we, when we tell someone, you know what, uh, I'm a believer in Jesus, and I, I believe he created me, he has a purpose for my life, I, he gave his life for me, I love him, I want to live for him. When we tell people that, People are listening, aren't they? They're watching. They're listening. And especially when we go th through times of difficulty, we can know that other prisoners are listening. Other prisoners are watching. People are seeing, how, okay, he says he's a believer in God. He says he believes that, that God has changed the way he thinks. He's got an eternal perspective. He says all this stuff, but now that, now that times are difficult, how is he or she going to respond? People are, people are watching. People are listening. When they know or stand upon Jesus in times of trouble, they're watching. Did Paul and Silas have something we don't have? That's a trick question. I mean, no, they didn't have something we don't have. They had the Spirit of God like we have the Spirit of God, right? Did they have something we don't have? No. Do, do we need to lay hold of something that Paul and Silas laid hold of? I think I do, right? I think I do. I don't know if I could have been singing. I'd have been complaining. Uh, I don't know if I'd have been singing and praying and worshiping. Perhaps there's something that we need to lay hold of that they owned, they possessed. 
So this jailer knows he's good as dead. Back in chapter 12, Peter had escaped, or God had set Peter free, and Herod uh, had all the jailers executed because of that. This jailer probably knew what happened to, to folks in charge when prisoners escape, and he thought he was good as dead, but nobody left. That's an interesting thing. So we've got the question, the question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the answer in verse 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household, this is, this is, for, all of, this is for all who come to Christ. We don't know why they didn't all leave immediately. Um, perhaps for Paul and Silas, perhaps escaping was not their first priority. Perhaps they thought, no, we're, God's given us an audience here and we're going we're gonna to do prison ministry, perhaps. But ultimately, uh, led this jailer and his family to Christ, baptized them, stayed in the home. Uh, not sure what happened to this man, but his question, what must I do to be saved? It's been the heart cry of millions since that day. It's not a theologian. This is a, a, a common man, a desperate heart. What must I do to be saved? That man, uh, at that moment, probably didn't know that his statement would be the heart cry of millions through the ages. The captives are set free. Here's our takeaway on, on this last point. The jailer rejoiced when he witnessed the power of the good news. The jailer rejoiced when he witnessed the power of the good news. Paul and Silas were set free before they were even set free, right? They were set free to worship when they were still bound. All kind of captives are being set free. And uh, bear with me, let's look at the last six verses of uh, chapter 16, verses 35 to 40, to conclude this chapter. But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police, saying, let those men go. And the jailer respond, uh, re reported these words to Paul, saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have, been, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The party is like Paul. Don't mess with this deal. Just get out of there. The police, report, um, the police reported these words to the magistrates. And they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them and took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Paul and Silas demand a, a public apology. It, it, that's pretty brazen, isn't it? That's pretty bold. Uh, they're Roman citizens. Hey, we're Roman citizens. You should not have done this to us. And here we, I mean, we just have to conclude that there's a time to, to stand our ground. There's a time, just like there's a time to, to worship uh, when we are suffering, to rejoice when we're suffering, but there's also a time to stay, take a stand and say, you know what, uh, no, I'm not just going to let this thing go. Or perhaps, one, maybe they were trying to discourage persecution in the future. Maybe they want to make sure the next group of believers that come in or the church that gets raised up doesn't face the same kind of thing, and they wanted to say, hey, the way you're treating folk around here is not right. Perhaps, secondly, maybe they wanted to just confront these officials with their misconduct. Hey, we want you to know what you did is not cool, and uh, this is no small thing. We're not just going to walk out of here and say, oops, that was a mistake. Perhaps they were trying to earn the, the, rep, the respect of the city officials. Maybe they wanted to witness to them. Hey, we want to let you know what we were doing. Uh, we were proclaiming Christ. Maybe they wanted to set the record straight. We're not sure, but they demanded a meeting with the city officials. So, like Lydia, the jailer extends hospitality and says, hey, come stay at my house. <clears throat> Both Lydia and this jailer said, would you come, please, uh, stay with us. Let us care for you. He tended to their wounds. New life in Christ, new life in Christ leads to rejoicing with others, right? Not just, hey, come to Christ, I'm going my way, but... There was something about Lydia, something about this jailer that said, I want to spend time together. New life in Christ leads to rejoicing with others. And then verse 40, and we'll close with this. 
Here Luke says they. They took off. They left Philippi. And, and here uh, we gather. Uh, Luke is going to use the they pronoun. They, they went there and this did this and that until they come back in chapter 20, until they come back through Philippi and Luke will join them there. That further leads us to believe that maybe Luke went to school in Philippi, knows the area, knows people in the area. When the gospel comes to town, the influential are transformed. The oppressed are delivered. The hard-hearted are irritated. The captives are set free. The gospel still works today. The gospel is still effective today. The gospel still works. Have you been, has your life been touched by the gospel? Have you been transformed by the gospel? Have you been set free by the gospel? The gospel, this isn't just some ancient text about something that used to happen. The gospel, when the gospel comes to town, it has effects, right? Sets people free, irritates, frustrates other people, depending on where you're at with light and darkness. So I want to close with this. The gospel is still powerful. Are, you, are we taking it to our town, to our world? Are we taking the gospel? It is still powerful. It still shakes folks up. There's still no, there's still no neutral response to the gospel. It ruffles our feathers to say we have sinned against a holy God. But it ought to delight our hearts to hear that God has paid the penalty for us. The gospel is still powerful. Are we taking it to our town? Are we taking it to our world? Are we seeing what the gospel can do today? Because, the, friends, the gospel still works. And it might frustrate, it might frustrate to pieces the people you share it with. But there are some who will be transformed by it. There are some who will be set free, delivered buy it. And that alone should cause us to say, God, I want to take the gospel to every, to everybody I come in contact with. Help me to find ways to express the goodness of God to those I come in contact with. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for this wonderful snapshot of the gospel coming to Philippi. Affecting the movers and shakers, business people, affecting the downtrodden, the oppressed, stirring up the hard-hearted, the wicked, setting captives free. Father, we're thankful that your gospel is doing its good work. Even as we're here gathered together this moment, your gospel is having its effect around the world. People right now are being irritated. People right now are being set free. Lord, would you allow us to take, our, take your gospel to our world. May we be faithful missionaries that take your good news to dry and thirsty lands. Father, thank you that your gospel be, will be at work today. As we go about the things that we're going to go about, your gospel still works. Would you allow us to take encouragement from that? Father, we, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.